All right, welcome everyone. We're uh, we're here on March fourteenth, two thousand twenty-one, and we have another guest, another mass maritimer that we know from school, another IMB graduate. We have Reed Wallemeyer on. He's coming in from Denmark, so we appreciate you uh, staying up uh, so late to be on with us. But uh, we're happy to have you here, and we're very curious if you can go over how you, uh, a couple of years ago, you know, you're like us in Buzzards Bay at Mass Maritime, and then now you're uh, in Denmark. Uh, working with a big time ship uh, manager, so we're a uh, ship supply company. So we're, we would like to hear your story and uh, we're happy to have you on. Yeah, yeah, guys, I appreciate you having me. It's um, definitely exciting to to be on here. I really do enjoy listening to podcasts. I've never been on one yet. So this is my, uh, yeah, my first time doing that. So it's exciting. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I can give you guys a quick, you know, kind of two minute intro of, of where I've where I'm at now and, and how I got there after graduating a few years ago. And then we can kind of dive into some specifics if we want to, but yeah, I graduated. Uh, What's that? Before you start, I'll just, uh, for people who aren't watching the video, it's, uh, myself, Colin Sheehan, Mark Wiggins, and then of course Reed. So yeah. Um, the floor is all yours. Yeah. Yeah. So I graduated mass maritime back in 2018. Um, IMB graduate, and when I graduated, I actually moved down to Houston, Texas to work with Risk Ship Supply in their acceleration program, which is basically a management training program. So it's, it's a two year long program where I get trained up in um, all the different departments we have in the company. So sales, purchasing, operations, and then I'm working on some projects regionally in the North America uh, region and also globally during that time. So kind of get exposure to the business from a pretty high level view. And then also in the day-to-day -day operations of, of our actual branches. So I lived in Houston for a year and a half. Um, and then after um, the end of, yeah, I think it was the Christmas of, of 2019, I was offered to uh, take a new role in our operational excellence department and actually move to our headquarters located in Alborg, Denmark. So now I'm over here in Denmark. I've been here just over a year. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'm working over here and, and I'm actually helping to align and, and optimize some of our global processes for sales and purchasing. So it's, a, it's very much a project manager type of role and I'm just trying to, to help lean out the business and make us as efficient as possible. No, that's awesome. Um, I like the fact that you did that training program and it sounds like you're able to rotate through a lot of different departments. Um, that's something that I had the opportunity to do with CMA CGM. I joined their fast track training program, went through sales, inside sales, customer service, operations, uh, procurement, rail, intermodal uh, mm -hmm. equipment. So just to be able to get that high level view um, I can really re relate with you. And I think it's very valuable for uh, people that come out of school that don't really know what they want to do yet. And when you can get experience in just like a little bit of everything, then you can come out of that and know what you want to do. And most importantly, know what you don't want to do. So I think that's great. Yeah, it's, it's a good point. I think another huge benefit of it is it helps you connect the dots between, you know, all the different departments in the company. So if you, you know, just go into sales right out of uh, school or right into the company, just, you know, in one department, you might not be able to get that full overview as if you spend, you know, four months in sales, six months in purchasing, another four months in intermodal like you did. So it, it gives you a pretty good overview of the entire business. Yeah, what, not what, to mention the network. Yeah, for sure. So what's it been like bouncing around between uh, departments, positions, but more so uh, uh, moving, you know, and actually going overseas? That's a big jump. You know, that's something that not everyone gets the opportunity to do. So I'm sure that wasn't something that was lightly handed. Oh, hey, you know, if you want, you can go live in the dirt. Like, no, you worked for that. Like you earned that, you hustled and you got it and you got it fast out of school. So I'm curious, you know, what was the, what was the fast track? What was the hustle like to get into a, a high level position like that and really grind, you know, grind away? Yeah, man, it, um, I mean, it was just like anything. It was just a lot of hard work. Um, I, I got, you know, into a really good program with risk and I, I just kind of took the opportunities I was given and the projects that I was given to work on and, and kind of just, you know, <laughs> worked as hard as I could on them. And 
I met some of the right people in the company and a position opened up in our operational excellence department, which was a new department at the time. And my profile and skill set fit what they needed. And um, yeah, one of the, uh, the managers reached out to my manager and asked if, if they could basically offer me the role. So that's kind of the, uh, yeah, that's, that's a quick overview of how it, how it worked. But I think that's with anything, man, you know, it's just work hard, meet the right people, you know, be friendly, always be, you know, one of the most likable guys or, or girls. And I think, you know, good things will come, come your way during your career. I'm, I'm going to disagree slightly and say it's not, you, you know, usual is people, they sit around, they wait, and they see an opening and they apply. It's another thing to get poached, if you want to use that word, but actually get sought out, you know, get picked, you know, to for this position. That's, you know, and especially if it's an entirely new department. So can, can you tell us what it was like, I'm sure, when you heard this offer at first, you know, 100%, you know, let's do it or maybe not, but what was, you know, what, what were you weighing the options and what was your consideration? You know, do I stay where I'm at or do I take this new opportunity, something that has never been done before, really? What was it like to make that decision? Yeah, so, it, I mean, it was a big decision. And, you know, right when I got offered the role, I mean, it, you know, in my mind, I was all in. I, I was right? all oh, in. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, didn't, I didn't want to let them know I was 100% committed right off the bat just because <laughs> you had to, you know, figure out, you know, the package and, and everything like that. Yeah. But um, man, it was exhilarating. I mean, you know, we're young guys. I think you guys are, are a year behind me graduating from from Mass Maritime. So as a 23, 24 year old kid getting asked to move over to Denmark, I mean, I'm all over the opportunity. It, it was really cool. And, you know, with my current role, I'm able to work with some of our regional directors, a lot of our sales managers. Um, we've actually got Boston Consulting Group inside our, our company right now helping us run some projects. So I work a lot with them. So it's, it's a really cool role to work with people, you know, all up and down the, the organization from, you know, kind of the executive level uh, to the front lines, like really figuring out how to integrate certain projects and, and processes. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with the role. It is cool. That's awesome. And like, what kind of role is it? You said it's operations. Um, what, what necessarily do you do? Yeah. So um, basically my kind of, Bird's eye view job description is, is I'm helping to create our global operating model for sales and purchasing. So we have 15 branches located uh, between North America, Europe, and then uh, Middle East, Far East. And I'm trying to align all of our sales and purchasing processes between all of the branches. So for example, if let's say Rotterdam has a really good process in sales and they can, you know, run really efficiently and hit all their KPIs for a certain process or, or a certain task that they do, then I'll take that and try and implement it into all of our other 14 branches globally so that we can gain the efficiency that Rotterdam figured out how to do everywhere. Are you in a place where you can make it almost a competitive amongst the branches, right? Like, cause whenever you find something great and you want to show it to everyone, you get two sides, right? You get the people who say, who look over at, you know, X team, you know, and they say, great, that's what, that's what they're doing. We want to do it too. And I'm sure, like you said, with so many branches, you also get teams that aren't a hundred percent willing to change, right? Like it's no, I, I know that's how they do it over there. That's yeah. different. We do it like this here. So what's the negotiation, nah, nah, I call it a negotiation, but you know, for, if this is your, you're the guy, you're the one who's organizing all this between different cultures, different time zones, different ways of doing things. How do you manage that? Because that's a big that's a big responsibility coming right off the bat. You know, people yeah. So uh, you know, kind of to your point about a certain branch maybe not wanting to change or people you know maybe being resistant. Change management is is a big part of of my role and also my colleagues' roles. So we are actually running through a change management kind of training course right now, so that we can figure out how to implement certain projects and certain new processes where we get buy-in from the local branch. Because it's very easy if you take the wrong approach to get immediate resistance and you know it becomes very difficult to implement anything at, at that point. So it's very much about your approach, very much also understanding what's actually going on in the branch. I think a lot of times people get hung up on really pretty PowerPoints and very nice you know, presentations and it looks good on paper, but the second you go to actually implement it and say, hey, let's try to do this, you figure out it doesn't work. And it's because, you know, us or me or my colleague as the project manager 
we didn't do the due diligence up front to figure out, you know, what is the front line actually doing right now? Does our project that looks great on a PowerPoint actually make sense to implement? So question for you based on that. Uh, you're lucky, or not lucky, you earned it, but you're in a good position where you're well-traveled. You're on a team of people who are well-traveled and specifically doing this, right? But just in terms of the company, you know, if it's, I'm going to make up an example here. You know, if there's an office in the UK or wherever, is it mostly UK residents there? Or, you know, as a company, as a whole, as a culture, are there a lot of people who have moved around and have been to different parts of the company and are more, you know, they have this understanding that we're in a much wider network. Um, you know, what's sort of the, the, the breakup uh, culturally within the company? Yeah, great question. Um, so I think we do have a, a lot of people in the company who have bounced around between different branches. So for example, one of our vice presidents over in North America, he's actually a Danish guy and he's living, um, I think he's in Vancouver. And he's in Vancouver right now running our Canada and also uh, New York branch. So, um, yeah, he's, he's been to Dubai. And, and now, like I said, he's, he's over in North America. Um, one of my colleagues, he's a British guy, and he actually started in Dubai. Then he went over to Manila in the Philippines to help out over there for a little bit. And now he's, he's in Denmark. So I think we do have a lot of people that travel around branches. But, you know, when you go to... Um, let's say Singapore, for example, most of the people in the branch are going to be from Singapore. And then you're going to have a couple of Danes, maybe an American, but usually it's, yeah, concentrated with, with the local people. And I, you know, I, I have to say the same is about, you know, same for Royal Caribbean. It, there's, you know, crew wise on board, you know, there's over a hundred nationalities represented. So yeah. you have to imagine that as people move up the ladder and they come on board, you have a hundred different nationalities in the office as well. Right. And it's yeah. great, right? Because you get a wide selection of, uh, of you know, experience and attitudes towards different things. It's awesome. I mean, I'm I'm one of two Americans on my team of seven. And, yeah. you know, the guys on board, I mean, I could count all the Americans on one hand, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's great. But one thing I, and this is what I'm curious about with RIST, right? Because it's so obviously, you know, maritime oriented, ship oriented, right? But of course, you know, you have, you have to have a division within the company of people who are coming from a maritime background. Maybe they sailed on board, never mind the academies. Maybe they sailed mm -hmm. on board and they understand what the customers need because they were there, right? They're on yeah. board and they changed over. And then you have people who are from all different walks, of, you know, of backgrounds. Do you find that there's ever, you know, may, if maybe, I don't want to say divisions, but, um, you know, differences of opinions based on that, or do you, and kind of, you know, on top of that, do you find that when you introduce people, right? Like if you're, or introduce yourself to new people in the company and they ask you who you are, right? Mm -hmm. And like I can say at Royal, the one of the first things people ask, especially, especially if you work in shipboard operations, they ask you, they're like, so where did you sail? Okay. And I gotta say, I gotta, I gotta say nothing, right? Like I, I haven't, right? And then that's, oh, you know, you're, you're on the other team if you didn't sail. But being from Mass Maritime, even just having my yearbook photo as my outlook, Gains a lot of respect off of that. Yeah. Just for the Royal. So I'm wondering if this, if it's the same with risk where, you know, if they, if you get asked, you know, where have you done before this? Oh, have you been on board? Oh, you haven't. And you describe mass her time and all of a sudden they get it. Like they understand why you're here. You don't have to prove that to anyone. They, everyone knows why you're here and what you're trying to get accomplished. Right. Yeah. So I think we, we do have that in our company, but it's, it's a, actually slightly different scope. So for us, it's not so much if we've been on board and sailed on a ship. It's if we've done kind of the old time ship channel or entrepreneurial type of business, you know, back in, call it 15, 20 years ago, because ship supply as a whole is extremely fragmented and you have a lot of local and regional uh, players, but RIST is really probably the only true global player in our entire industry. So we have a really unique oh. market position and we're, and we're able to leverage that and, and do some really cool things. But where that kind of, you know, you know, healthy competition comes in is back with the, you know, they call them old time ship channelers. And they were, you know, back in the day doing deals with captains and, and making sure they secure the order kind of by, you know, really running like actual sales, you know, actually really developing that relationship and having this entrepreneurial spirit about them. Whereas, 
Now we see that we need to introduce new systems and processes and kind of a very logistical mindset into our company so that we can get our, you know, operational costs down. We can really like get good at last mile delivery logistics so that we can, you know, deliver to our customer at the lowest cost possible for us. And we start to see that division a little bit right there where some, some people are, you know, extremely customer focused and it's all about like, let's, you know, satisfy the customer and, and it's all about them, which is true to an extent, but at the same time, we need to make money in order for us to satisfy our customer. So that's, yeah, the logistical versus the old time ship channeler mindset is, is a little bit where we see some, uh, yeah, some of that healthy competition. When you say a customer, are you working directly with the ship owners or are you working with Port agent. the ship agents? Um, um, both. So like both? your company, CMA, CGM, you guys are one of our, our major global customers. Um, okay. Maersk is one of our major global customers. I actually, Mark, I don't know if we supply Royal Caribbean or not. I know we have a big cruise business in New Orleans and, and Long Beach, but I actually, I'm not sure if Royal is one of our, our customers, but um, we're, we're working with, yeah, all the ship owners. Um, and then we coordinate with the agents for delivery and port. Cool. Yeah. Um, one of my internships as a ship yeah. agent for a summer, um, going back and forth between Boston, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, Providence, Rhode Island, New Bedford, Mass. Yeah. And sometimes I had to go back and forth with the ship, just find them random parts from the auto zone. I think uh, yeah. it was like a small research vessel in New Bedford. They were actually testing the the seabed for the offshore wind farms. Um, they had some sort of cool instrument and they had a bunch of scientists on board. But uh, their vessel like ran out of Freon for their AC. So it was oh. like 90 to 100 degrees like – every day like that week and um i just had to go back and forth until i could find like the right adapter and just give them like buy up like 20 cans of like the mini freon that you use for like your car and just bring it to them <laughs> just so they had, they could have a ac work until like they could actually get it fixed but like stuff like that um as a ship agent um just running like little tasks like that um bringing crew members with me to uh the red wing stores so they can get some new boots yeah <laughs> yeah being a ship man ship agents I, I tip my hats to them because it's a lot it is a lot to coordinate everything when a vessel comes into port and if something pops up yeah you're gonna have to think on your feet and, and figure it out so I, I have a question for you then uh please correct me where i'm wrong right the old when you're talking about the old school way of doing things right i imagine that it's not so much of a like a global focus and it's more you know i'm based out of i'll use myself like i'm based out of miami right so i'm looking at mm -hmm. only ships that are coming in and out of miami and i'm trying to get their business because i'm here i have my local contacts and i can get them supplies here versus what wrist is doing is i know where you're like we have your itinerary we know every, we have contacts and everywhere where you're going to go we have you covered everywhere is that correct i mean i know that's super that's like super high level but is that kind of like you know what you were describing with the old school way of doing things where you, you said it was very entrepreneurial and go-getter you know maybe not as you know globally oriented no i think that's a fair statement and um you know like, like i said before the market for ship supply is really fragmented so i mean you you yeah. just have tons of local and regional suppliers because if you think about kind of what it takes to set up shop um in a local port it's it's not a you know it's very capital intensive to set up shop somewhere because you need to find contacts with suppliers. You need to somehow leverage your uh, purchasing power so that you can buy at a cheap price. You need to find customers. And there's already going to be several ship suppliers in that port that are trying to do the same exact thing. So that, that yeah, the entrepreneurial kind of spirit, you, you have that with a lot of local suppliers. And that's where we actually see a lot of our competition in North America is some of these local suppliers that will do, you know, a couple million dollars a year in sales with um, five or 10 customers that, that are, you know, they've got great relationships with. And, and that's, that's difficult to try and, you know, coax those customers away and, and bring them on board to, to risk when they've had a, a relationship with a local supplier for 10 years or, or however long. No, for sure. And just to switch up the topics a little bit. Um, I think you, got your master's at Southern Methodist University. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm wearing my, uh, my oh, nice. right now. Yep. 
Um, yeah, so I'm, I am in my second to last semester at Damn. SMU's Cox School of Business. Um, I'm doing my master's purely online, so I can continue to work while I do that. And that's what I wanted to do. So I'll be graduating in August and taking a vacation somewhere around the world and probably going to go sit on a beach and, and find a nice little... On a cruise bar. in the Caribbean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's no, that's sweet. Yeah. Um, at some point, I definitely want to get my master's in something. Uh, probably wait a couple of years. See if CMA will help me out. But um, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. how is that for like people that are interested in it? How is it balancing that work and yeah. school balance? Um, do you find it rewarding in what you do uh, at work? Um, you know, like yeah yeah, yeah. paying off yeah so yeah i i'll, I'll hit the uh I'll, I'll kind of respond in a couple different angles to, to give you guys a full picture um number one i absolutely see what i'm learning in my master's paying off at work so not only is it the kind of knowledge that i'm gaining but it's understanding the full scope of the business and tying in you know leadership and, and people management with um, finance and really understanding, you know, how the business makes money and, and what operational costs are and what the different financial statements look like, um, as well as understanding, you know, go to market strategies and, and how to, you know, maintain and, and continue to grow customers. It's, it's kind of encompassing all of that. So Good. that is extremely beneficial. Um, managing it from a workload perspective. I mean, it's, it's, definitely not a walk in the park. I would tell anyone that if you guys are looking to work full time and get your masters, like be prepared to be extremely organized. You need to have your week set up, you know, pretty detailed so that you can figure out when you have to do what so that you're not missing deadlines at work or in school. Um, be prepared to give up some weekends. I've given up a lot of weekends to, to work on schoolwork, but at the same time, it is manageable, you know, I'm, I'm almost done. I have a lot of my classmates who are, who are also doing great in school. So it's manageable and it's achievable and it's extremely rewarding kind of to sit down, you know, maybe at the end of the month or at the end of my semester and, and have a, a beer and just sit back and look and say, okay, so this semester I completed a, you know, cost analysis course along with the supply chain management course while working full time. Um, so that yeah. sense of achievement is, is really cool. And I'm excited to, I'll kind of see how that feels in August when I'm totally done. I'm going to add yeah, two I mean, things I, on I, to that. During, during a pandemic yeah. and in another country, in a different time zone, in an yeah. industry that's basically 24-7. Yeah. So speaking of time zones, you know, I actually have two synchronous sessions a week yep. for uh, school. And that means I have to wake up at – Oh God, it's uh, my classes are at like 645 at night, Dallas time. So that's where SMU is located. So I'm up at 145 to 315 doing school a couple, couple of mornings a week. That's awful. <laughs> but it's, it's such a mindset thing because I mean, yeah. it's, it's anyone can do it. It is doable. Right. You just have to, you got to be disciplined and willing to sacrifice in other areas of your life. That's, that's all it boils down to. Yeah. I, and I, I remember I, you in school. You were disciplined too. I mean, I remember you. You were one of those guys who I could go any, I could go to the gym at like any time and I'd see you in there. You know what I mean? Like, I, you know, and focus too, not just in there, you know, blah, 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 doing a run on your phone. I remember that. I remember you liked that in school. You know, we, we took a couple classes together. I remember you were the one who was always like, uh, you know, like if you were in a group project, like, you know, no hands are being raised. We know who the leader in the group is. You know what I mean? Like it was in that entrepreneurial class. We did, we, you know, that was like 10 kids. I don't know if yeah, you know and class. we were also, I think you and I worked on um, some big capstone project with Porsche as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah, same thing. Yeah, exactly that. It's like, all right, like we, we all know what's up. All right, Reed, tell, tell, me what, tell me what I need to do. I'll do it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so man. I'm not too surprised that you can manage this, you know, in another country, different time zone, 24 hours during a pandemic. Yeah, and I tell you what, almost selfishly for me, 
this is a great time to have a pandemic because I do have stuff to do. So close the bars, give me no distractions. And yeah, let me just do, do work in school for a little bit. So. Right. You get, you're in, you're in another country, you're in Europe. It's fun, right? Somewhere new, but you're also not like, man, you know, I, I came over here and I'm not, I'm not getting to do anything with it. So yeah, perfect timing. Um, you're how- done in August, right? Yeah, totally done in August. So I actually, I finish up my classes in May and then I have a three month like thesis project, capstone project, whatever you want to call it. So when that's completed in August, then I'm totally done. How are you like in Denmark so far? Um, Do you see yourself staying there for a while or are you going to be rotating around a little bit more? Yeah. So honestly, Denmark's a great country. It is um, a totally different system than the U.S., and right. I've really like kind of reevaluated my thoughts around kind of social systems and, and what I, what I can see work and versus right. what, you know, doesn't work or, or like that. Um, but they're an extremely educated society. Everyone, you know, has a college degree and mm. the government actually pays for college up through your doctorate. Wow. So it's, it's all, yeah, it's, it's all self, self-funded so you can go to college for free that's that's great you definitely make up for it on on the tax side but i mean if you look at statistics denmark year in year out is ranked as one of the happiest countries in the world yeah right so i mean they've got it figured out and work-life balance over here is great Mm -hmm. um so it's a really cool country to be in very cool country to be in um i'll probably be staying here another couple years i don't know where exactly my steps after that will lead but you know, I, I, I'm sure yeah, I don't blame you. Something will pop up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a big change. Mark, you went to Norway for Texas. like a. Yeah. It's, um, man, I go, I go hot, cold, hot, cold. So I I'm born and raised in Florida. Then I went to school in Massachusetts, then over to Texas, <laughs> now over to Denmark. So I, I have a question about that too. And I know Colin, you're asking about Norway and I want to tie it in. I mean, we we're only there for three weeks, but, um, and that's the only time I've left the country. Right. Yeah. Um, and it was fun for me. My family came from Norway. So I was all about it. All right. I was having fun. And I, I remember uh, one of the big things that I noticed, you know, of course, when you get talking with people, you know, Denmark, like Norway, like everyone there knows English, I'm sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like they speak it better than people here for the most part. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you're right. And uh, yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, I remember the thing that struck me the most about Scandinavians and in Norway in particular, um, especially people who were working in the maritime field, there's a very like old world feeling to it. You know, like these, like whenever you go to institutions or you meet people that represent companies that have been around for like hundreds of years, you know, if not more. And I'm Mm -hmm. wondering if you get that same feeling in Denmark, that old world feeling that is very well established things have been here for hundreds of years you know like there's not uh there's not a lot of confusion about what we are like what what are we doing here yeah i I think that is accurate as europe you know for europe as a whole when you try and compare it to the u.s i mean we are such a young country compared to everywhere else in the world i mean we've yeah only been around for you know 300 years or, or so but it's yeah. Um, I mean, Denmark definitely has a rich history, so it's, yeah. yeah. I, I, and they're a heavy hitter in the industry. I mean, Mer- ev- I'm sure everyone in, in Denmark knows the name Maersk. I mean, you know, oh, yeah. it's the size of Microsoft, you know, yeah. it's not, well, they don't have sea blindness, you know? No. And, and Copenhagen is, is huge. I mean, you have so many yeah. shipping companies that, that um, have their headquarters there or have offices there. So it must be fun when you get to tell people, you know, like if you meet people there and like, oh, you know, oh, you're an American. What are you here for business? And you get to tell them what they work in. Everyone knows what, you, what you're talking about. You don't have to explain anything. That has to be a huge benefit. I saw that in Miami. The thing that I love about it, the port is, you know, so man-made island is between Miami and, and Miami Beach. Mm-hmm. Right. So when, you know, take MacArthur Causeway to go to the beach, you see the cruise lines lined up. Like everyone knows the industry. There's no sea blindness at all, you know. It's a very well-known, well-established, like people, everyone knows the name. Yeah. Um, and I love that. And I'm, I'm sure you feel, I'm sure you get the same in Denmark, right? You tell people you work in ship supply, they, they already have something to say. They already have something to applaud. Yeah. And, and I tell you what, RIST is so well-established in Alborg, where, where I live, that most people know the company. I know yeah. they've had a friend that has worked there over the years or a family member or 
yeah, a friend of a friend, whatever. But a lot of people do know the company. That's awesome. Where is, yeah. uh, just out of curiosity, where is Alborg in comparison to Copenhagen? And is yeah, it like a so smaller it, city, town? Like, So Alborg is, oh gosh, I think it's the third or fourth biggest city in Denmark. Good. And we've got about 150,000 people here. It's like so, Worcester, right? Yeah, that's the size of yeah. Worcester. So to put it in comparison, Denmark has right around 6 million people, just under 6 million people. And mm -hmm. Houston, where I moved from, has five, five and a half million people in it. So you take a city, yeah. Yeah. their population, and put it into an entire country. That's the size comparison we're talking about. Yeah. Um, but Alborg is like a two and a half, three hour boat ride northwest of Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, it's kind of on a, it's on the other side of, of Denmark. Denmark is almost right. shaped like a U a little bit. And pe I'm sure people there are very curious when you tell them like, oh yeah, you know, I'm from Florida and I've lived in Texas and Massachusetts. They have to have a million questions. Oh, they do. And, and it, you know, it's funny, even when I try and speak the very little bit of Danish that I know, they <laughs> immediately, they just respond to me in English because they, they <laughs> like, just yeah. the accent. Yeah. They know I'm not from here. Um, <laughs> and maybe it's, it's also my cowboy boots that give it away. I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely want to start traveling a little bit more. Um, I've been in Norfolk for almost two years now. And then July, CMA is actually going to send me out to the West Coast for a year or maybe six months now. We'll we'll see how it goes um, just to get some operations experience at the port, L.A., Long Beach, and then maybe nice. Seattle and then uh, Dutch Harbor, Alaska. Um, okay. Dutch Harbor, uh, that's one of – I think it's the only – owned and operated uh, terminal. It used to be uh, owned by APL. And uh, so I'll be working there to see how it, how it works. Um, like a completely operated by CMA CGM. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to get some operations like experience. Cause right now I'm doing Marine sourcing. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like a, a bridge between operations and finance. Uh, we negotiate all the contracts with the Marine suppliers, uh, the Marine terminals, tug companies, stevedores, everyone. And uh, it's so great to like understand the spend behind everything at the terminals. And then uh, come July, when I go to LA Long Beach, I'll like actually understand everything and then see where some efficiencies could be gained and how to make improvements. So just to get like that well-rounded experience, yeah. And then also just to like move to LA. Yeah, that's great, man. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for it. You're going to enjoy your time out on the West yeah. Coast. And I know there's a ton of maritime grads that are in Long Beach, especially. Yeah, exactly. And I know a handful that are in Seattle. And then um, I see pictures of, of yeah, uh, some of the seagoing guys and girls that are up in, up in Dutch Harbor as well. Do they have a wrist office in Long Beach? Yeah, we do. Yeah. We're, in Long, we're in Long Beach. We're in uh, Portland. We uh, used to be in Oakland, but now we we actually just yeah supply that um, from from our other from our other locations. Very cool, very cool. And we're also in Seattle. So, question for you: You know, I, this is something that uh, you know, Colin and I have talked about just with our own personal lives, personal career. Um, you know, Colin's lucky where he's in a good he's in a good situation where he's he's very you know what he spends his day doing it's very ship oriented and not too corporate oriented and i'll explain that a little bit more in a second and i i feel it at royal too where i'm lucky where i'm on a team that's shipboard operations right even if you know that's the focus of it but there are opportunities that are still within the company but you know more corporate oriented you're not doing something with the ship every day do you ever get nervous that you're moving in one direction or another within brist you know that or do you do you not really have a preference or how do you feel you know, in terms of staying alongside with what's actually going on on board and, you know, actually going on with sail to the ship versus being a little bit away from the action, but in a more, what sounds like what you have a knack for, which is strategy and, you know, optimization, implementation and that leadership side, you know, that's the trade-off with leadership, right? So you don't get to be there, you know, doing the operations or behind the scene. How do you feel like that with your own career and making those decisions? 
Yeah. So for me, I, I honestly, I think I'm in a really good spot for my skill set and what I like to do. So project management, um, process optimization, uh, strat, like overall strategy and figuring out, you know, what ways do we need to move the business operationally to hit long-term strategic goals? I mean, that, that's, that's what makes me tick. Like I really enjoy that. So yeah, again, my role, very project management oriented, almost like an inside consultant kind of. So yeah, like, yeah, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I either, you know, have projects kind of dumped on my plate or when I'm working on stuff, I can see where we can get efficiencies and basically just create the project myself pitch it to my manager or my team and, and we can say, yeah, let's, let's do this. This makes sense. Let's, let's run with this. No, that you know, seems really cool. Cause it, I mean, it's very high level, right? So it seems like you can see these different areas of improvement and then actually pitch the idea and actually see it come together. Um, I feel like I'm in like a similar position in my company. It's a very small team, um, me and two other people. And, uh, you just have that influence in some of your decision making. And I think it's really cool. I'm glad we're recording this because what you just described, what you do is like in my head, you know, when I, you know, how I would describe it, I, you know, when, when someone asks me, oh, like, I, you know, <laughs> it's hard to describe, but so I'm going to, I'm glad I'm going to take what you said and remember it by heart because it's, it's, it's a really great feeling to have. Right. And the best thing, and I'm, I'm sure you get this feeling, right? Here's the best, right? And, you know, everyone, I'm sure everyone there, they know you're doing your master's. They know you're a hard, you know, go-getter, right? The best is when, you know, you have what you need to do, what people are asking you to do. But when you get that done, right? Or when you can just move past it and you have that open bit of free time and you get to work on things that no one's asking for, but you're working to pitch it to them, that's an amazing feeling. And yeah. not many jobs have that. That's yeah, an amazing I feeling. I, I totally agree. And it's very cool to see where my department has come from in the past two years because it, it didn't exist two years ago. And so we've had to create processes and structure regionally and globally to filter ideas and you know, thoughts for improvement up you know, from the front lines to basically our team where we can say, yes, let's do this. Or you know, maybe this should be more of a local kind of, kind of decision. So it's really cool to see where we've come in, in a pretty short amount of time. So qu question for you, aside from, you know, transforming somehow into Reed Wallemeyer, what, if, what's your suggestion, you know, if you're if for maybe someone who's a recent graduate, maybe someone a year below us, right. Uh, or someone who's getting into internships, right. Cause I, I had that too. I had that same experience where I interned with Royal and uh, at the end of the internship, they made a whole new position based off of it. And just like you said, it's, you know, and I love how you said, you know, it's amazing to see where you were two years ago. I, I feel, you know, we have the same discussions on my team, you know, it's crazy to see where we were two years ago before they even had an analyst position. But yeah. so, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, you, you might not, it's not something you read about, right? It's just something you kind of have to have inside of you, right? So what would be your suggestion for someone, let's say they're, let's say they're a, a junior or senior at Maritime, right? Or wherever, it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be Maritime but they're a couple years behind and they're, they're starting internships maybe this summer or they're, they're just starting at a new job, right? What is your suggestion? What's been working for you? What is it that gets you, you know, into the mode or gets you into a position where you can sort of choose your path at work because you do really good work and people are wanting you to come to their team. So mm -hmm. how do you coach that? How do you train that to someone? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think – there's a lot of different things that play into that, but what works for me and what I kind of boil down my strategy to is like, you know, it, it, it's two or three things and it's pretty, it's pretty damn simple. Number one, I wake up early. You know, I think waking up early is, is huge for success. You wake up, you either read, you get your workout in, you do whatever you need to do before you actually start your work day so that when you go into work, you're mentally clear and you're ready to attack the day. You don't roll out of bed, take a quick shower and jump into the office. You do something in your personal life before you go to work. It could even be going on a walk. I, I don't know what you want to do, but. Just, I go to the beach. Not going to lie. Yeah. That's what I do. Yeah. It could be Can't that. Remember, but yeah. But do, do something personal for yourself before the workday starts. So wake up early. That, that's a big one for me. Um, number two, um, you know, 
I would say just understand where you are in your career and, and understand, you know, at 22 or 25 or 30, it's okay to be at that point where you are, as long as you have kind of a vision and a path forward, you know, you want to be able to see in five years, where do I want to be? And is my daily work, you know, kind of contributing to that long-term goal. And right, yeah, yeah, you know, for a couple months or a couple years, you know, you have to pay your dues. I mean, everyone has to pay your dues. You know, I think most of your twenties, you're probably going to be paying your dues and, you know, even into your thirties and forties, it just depends on what exactly you want to do. And the equation and the answer is different for everybody because everyone has different goals and aspirations. Right. And I but, think, I think for myself, like every like few months, I like write down some sort of career path or yeah, like we'll ideas where I want to do. And it always changes. I mean, I'm always like on the same trajectory. You mm -hmm. just like take a couple different turns because um, as you get more experience, you understand what you're good at and your strengths and weaknesses, what you can improve on. And I think um, also there's more, there's new opportunities that come to you every day. So that kind of steers you in one direction from the other. But yeah, like every few months, I always just like look back at what I was thinking of and then make a little alterations. But for, yeah. I think what you said, it's really important to kind of think about what you want to do and where you see yourself being in the next like couple of years, five years. For sure. And I think it's really important also to understand that, you know, you might not love what you're doing today, but you need to understand that how you do anything is how you do everything. So when you're doing jobs, you don't love, you know, still putting in that work and that effort into them is, is crucial. So Number one, waking up early. Number two, how you do anything is how you do everything. And number three, honestly, just, just be good to people. I mean, be nice, offer a helping hand, you know, understand that people have, you know, tough days and there's stuff going on outside of work. So man, just, just be nice. You know, it's, 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 it's a simple formula. The effect you have on others is the most valuable currency there is. Yeah, for sure. So awesome. those, those would be the three points that, that I would kind of, you know, suggest that, that I've worked for me. So similar question, you know, cause obviously this is something that you think about and not only that, but you actually work on, right? Like mm -hmm. this is something that you have going on every day. Like you said, you're up every morning. This is something that is at the tip of your tip of your head every day. Do you focus on man? It doesn't have to be one or the other, right? You always go back and forth a little bit. Do you try to double down on your strengths? Like if you're looking at everyone in the room, you know, on your team or within the company and, you know, you start to have that realization, you're like, you know what, there's just whatever it could be, you know, one, two, but there's just, there's this one thing that I have that, you know, maybe I'm not an expert on in general, but I'm doing, I know I can do it better than everyone else in the room. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you double down on that? Or are you looking at, when you wake up every day, are you looking at what, what did I fail at yesterday? basically what are my weaknesses and how, how do I plug those? How do you do that personally? What's your balance between those two different mindsets? Yeah, that's a great question, man. That's a really good question. Um, personally, I think I, oh, this is not going to be the answer you want to hear, but I, I kind of do both <laughs> a little bit. So I think right. I, no, that's, that's, that's know, reasonable. Everyone does. Yeah. Yeah. So I definitely focus on, you know, where are my weaknesses and how can I improve? So every manager I've had so far in my career, um, I've kind of very, you know, upfront in the start of our you know, relationship, I said, like, I like open, honest and direct feedback. If you don't like something I'm doing, or you say, you know, Reed, you botched that meeting, or, you know, I need you to shift your mindset a little bit, like, tell me, okay, yeah. because I, I need, I need direction. I'm not good with signals and stuff like that. Just, just tell me exactly. So I think I definitely like to focus on my weaknesses. But when you also look at leaders and managers and directors and companies, they understand where their strengths are and they will defer to an expert on their team. So it's about understanding the team's strengths. If, you know, Colin, if you are the algebra genius and I have an algebra problem come up and we're a team, I'm going to defer that to you instead of me taking it and, you know, maybe spending five hours of my time when it could right. take you one hour of your time to do the same thing and the team's efficiency improves. Right. Awesome. Well, I think that we uh, gave a lot of our listeners uh, something to chew. Um, 
this has been a really good conversation and mark do you have any last words because i think that i do um yeah go ahead so one one quick one right because I, I know you i i don't i don't i can only see you and the wall behind you but i know wherever you are there's a stack of books somewhere oh yeah the, so i'm wondering what's what's the top i mean for myself you know, I, I got, you know, a big stack, but mom's a librarian, so I got a lot of books as gifts, but, you know, the ones that are, you know, you know, uh, you know, uh, Treasure Island, you know, you only got to stick to three, right, for the rest of your life. Mine are really how to win friends and influence people. I mean, I think about that every day, um, yeah. and the other two are on strategy and another one, but so I'm wondering what are your, what's on your read list? Yeah, so, um, I have how to win friends and influence people as well, um, but actually, I think my top two or three, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, incredible book. Um, that multiple, yeah. yeah that other think, guests say the same thing, yeah. Yeah, you know, as young guys like we are, I think, you know, it's crucial that we understand how to build wealth at a young age. So if, yeah, the listeners, read Rich Dad, Poor Dad if you haven't already. It'll, it'll really kind of put everything in perspective. Um, I also love The Millionaire Next Door. The Millionaire Next Door, it's, it's, a, it's a book about basically, because um, we live in such a materialistic society nowadays, it's a book about frugality and kind of, you know, just being, you know, more simple with your things and, and what you want, but also investing money in areas where it matters, like wealth advisors, accountants, lawyers, you know, getting that team kind of together with you. So th those are two that have had a really big impact on me. I think Moran, I don't know if you, uh, we, he was on uh, quite a while ago, at least a month ago. Moran, I'm pretty, if I remember correctly, he had both of those on his list too. You know, he got asked the same question and he had both, <laughs> he had both of those on top of, you know, a handful of others. But uh, yeah, yeah, he recommended, he recommend, recommended never split the difference. Yeah, which I bought. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I listened to that about three times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on audio book. Because yeah. it just fun. like, it, it applies to everything in life. Um, and especially in my position with marine sourcing, having to negotiate oh, yeah. with all these people. Um, it's it's kind of crazy, the psychology you can kind of get behind when it comes into like these negotiations that you put yourself in. But that could be, just... like, it could be anything, any day, like, you know, like bartering with someone random, you know. Um, but yeah, Never Split the Difference is a good one. Um, then I started reading this book, How to Think Like a Rocket Scientist, it kind of... <laughs> But like it, it brings you back to like first principles thinking. I think yep. uh, Elon Musk and like uh, everyone at Tesla kind of has that same mindset. Um, if something's not working out, go back to the very first principles, uh, the most basic um, way they can think about something and then you might come up with something better. Yeah, totally agree to that. When you were talking about doing you know, reaching out to other teams within risk, you know, across, you know, in different parts of the country and, you know, oh, this is how we do this, you know, and you're introducing ideas from other, I immediately thought of, I think the first or second chapter of, of how to win friends and influence people when it was uh, the example that Dale Carnegie gave was uh, there was a safety advisor going around construction sites and he had to tell people, you know, put your helmet on basically. And, you know, no one wanted to do it. They felt like they were getting bossed around and, you know, this guy, basically flipped it and was giving a helping hand rather than a direction and everyone wore their helmets you know that's I immediately thought of that example when you're talking about reaching out to people and it's like am I going to offer you am I going to tell you what to do or I'm going to offer you a toolkit am I going to offer you something that's going to help you know and guide you in that way versus you know or, you know policies have changed you have to do it like this I totally agree not not many people like being told what to do a lot of people will follow leadership <laughs> that's <laughs> it boils down to that well, great. Well, thank you for coming on, man. We've been on yeah, for, thank you. No, uh, for an hour, man. Um, man, yeah. you got you got me you got me uh, jazzed up too. You know, you bring bring a lot of energy to the table now. I mean, I'm gonna slam this and go on my work here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, guys, this was awesome. I really appreciate you having me on. Um, really enjoyed our conversation. It was good. Good talking to you guys. Yeah, spread the word. Um, if you know any, we want to get some deck and uh, engine kids on here yeah. too. So if you know anyone and they're interested. Uh, definitely spread the word yeah i will for sure and i'll um whenever this comes out on on youtube or linkedin or wherever you guys have it i'll, I'll share it and we'll, we'll try and get the word out perfect 
Well, uh, thank you very much, Reed. Yeah. Awesome guys. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. We'll see you. Bye.